uh, in ways that are you know, functioning in society if you don't, if you can't even agree on, on the scientific facts. So I see this discussion as sort of a precursor to doing bioethics. Um, I, I really think that in order to do good bioethics, you have to know the, uh, you have to do the good science. You have to, to talk to the experts in whatever field you're doing. And I want to provide a, a bit of a philosophical foundation for, uh, for that claim, for how to think about the development of scientific knowledge. And then we'll sort of come back to the question of how this relates to bioethics at the end as well. So um, just to give you an idea of how things will be overviewed, you can kind of track this as we go along. Um, I'm going to do a really brief introduction to philosophy of science. Uh, if you haven't ever had a philosophy of science course before or haven't really studied it in a more uh, formal way, I'll just introduce you to what that means. Then I want to talk about historical context a little bit. I also teach in the history of philosophy, and um, I think that a lot of what we do now is informed by what has happened before, that the ideas and um, systems and ways of being in the world, um, we don't just sort of have those out of nowhere, we inherit them from a particular context. And so I want to talk just very briefly, uh, really too briefly, about uh, a little bit of historical context that I think is relevant to the larger discussion. And then we're going to spend most of our time on section three, which is talking about why trust science. And this was the reading that you did for today uh, by Naomi Oreskes, and she um, takes you on this sort of whirlwind tour through about the last hundred years in the, the philosophy of science, um, really focusing in on this question of why, why trust science? Um, why should try, you know, scientific knowledge be prioritized? And uh, I think she's got a really interesting uh, and worthwhile answer to think about um, to that question. So I want us to kind of land there for most of it. And then we'll come back at the very end and just uh, do some application, think about how this applies to bioethics and setting up a framework for, um, for what you're going to do throughout the rest of this May intercession class. So here's the intro to philosophy of science. What is it if you haven't ever done philosophy of science before? Um, it includes at least these things and, and more, um, but a lot of philosophy of science focuses on the methods of scientific knowledge production and their justification. So um, it's doing the theory of science, thinking about how scientific knowledge is produced um, and why those are good methods uh, as opposed to other things that people have done and continue to do. Um, where they claim to get their knowledge from. Why does science have some sort of priority? Why should it be trusted as opposed to some other source of knowledge? Um, philosophy of science includes the critical examination, analysis, and development of background assumptions and concepts used in scientific inquiry. So uh, there are all kinds of background assumptions about ourselves, about our uh, abilities of, of gathering information and knowledge about our, our thinking and our reasoning abilities about our society and the world that affect the way that scientists think that affect the way that scientists work and analyzing and examining some of those concepts um, is part of philosophy of science and you'll get some very specific philosoph like philosophies of science so you'll have philosophy of biology focusing on biology or philosophy of physics focusing specifically on physics um, ecology and these sorts of things um, and then also you get normative questions about science, and these would be questions about values, aesthetics, ethics, and here is one place that uh, bioethics obviously fits in. What I mean by normative questions here is I mean questions about value, about what people should and shouldn't do. And anytime you're talking about ethics, really the core ethical questions are not descriptive questions. So when you're thinking about a descriptive question, you're thinking about a question that describes how things are. And science is really a primarily a descriptive project, right? You're trying to understand what the world is like, see if we can describe the way that it, you know, that it is, how, you know, what's in it, how, how's it composed, how does it interact with other things? That's a very, um, that's sort of the focus of scientific inquiry. Whereas when you get to normative questions, you start dealing with norms about how ought people to act? What should we do? How should we, um, how should we treat each other just because we can do something? doesn't mean that we should, um, or does it, right? Those are the kinds of questions that are in the normative realm, um, precisely because they deal with how humans should act toward each other and toward ourselves and toward the natural environment. 
And those are the questions I think that uh, you really get into in a bioethics course, thinking about um, what human beings should do and how we should treat each other in areas of, of life sciences, medicine, and so on and so forth. So that's a little background about what, what you might uh, see in a philosophy of science um, class or in the philosophy of science in readings more generally. And you can see how uh, in many ways that's sort of foundational to um, a bioethics course. And I like to put it this way that uh, I think about philosophy of science as aiming to develop a critical theory of science. So we're not scientists, I don't do science. I'm not producing scientific knowledge or doing lab research or anything like that. Um, that's for the scientists who have been specifically trained in those ways and it's fantastic. And, uh, but that's not what, what I'm doing here. Um, rather it's, it's developing a theory of science, a critical theory of science. So an account of what science is, how does it work? How is it different from non-science? What are its limits? Uh, what are its values? Do we need to revise anything in light of our developing understanding of ourselves and our world? And it's critical in the sense that it's always asking questions, it's analyzing, it's examining. It's not just um, you know, describing science as it is right now, but it's thinking about what science has been, what science could be um, as we continue to develop, I think, um, a more deep and more nuanced understanding of ourselves and our world. So, um, good. I wanted to, okay, so that's that's the end of the sort of intro section. Um, I wanted to say also that if you have questions or comments as we go along and you want to use the chat for those, please feel free to do that. Um, I kind of have to switch back and forth here to be able to see the chat because of the way that I've got my screen sharing set up. But um, if you want to drop questions into the chat just so that they're there so we can come back to them um, or, you know, at any point of, you know, we can make sure that we don't lose those as we go through and then we'll have time for questions at the end and then also uh, a longer discussion after a little bit of a break. Okay, so next we're moving on to historical context, um, the beginnings of scientific knowledge. And uh, I, I think it's interesting to think about where uh, science comes from and where science all got started. And uh, anytime you're telling a historical story, you've got, uh, you know, sort of different um, ideas about how far back does science go. Some folks say, well, science is really old. It goes all the way back to people just trying to understand their world. <clears throat> Excuse me using observations and um and uh, you know descriptions to try to interact with realities some uh, identify some uh, scientists of a sort in ancient greece or in ancient china for instance um but i want to focus on the word scientific because i think that gives some insight into when science at least as we know it now as this um sort of discipline that includes a whole bunch of different things from chemistry to biology to physics to medicine to um, ecology all different sorts of sciences, um, health and natural sciences, um, mathematical sciences. Where did all that get going? Where, how far back can we trace this? And I want us to look at the idea of science um, because uh, I think it's a really useful way of, of approaching scientific knowledge. So um, I want to introduce you to a, another term. This is the term natural philosophy. So those of you uh, who might be familiar with the, the origins of the term philosophy know that it came from a Greek word, the words actually a combination of two Greek words, the words philo, which uh, has to do with love, specifically kind of a, a friendship kind of love, and then sophia, meaning wisdom. So when you put those together, you get love of wisdom, and that's where the word philosophy comes from. And for a long time, if you follow sort of the Western trajectory, if you kind of go back to ancient Greece and then follow kind of what happens in Europe, um, this idea of philosophy was a really broad umbrella that captured anybody who was trying to um, inquire about the world, trying to understand things, trying to, to, to have knowledge. And that term lasts for a long time. It really lasts all the way up into the scientific revolution. And many of the well-known figures of the scientific revolution, names that you might be familiar with, such as like Francis Bacon or Isaac Newton or Rene Descartes, Margaret Cavendish. Um, these are folks who actually didn't consider themselves scientists because that term wasn't used in the same way then. Um, they considered themselves natural philosophers. And so this idea of a philosopher being someone who studied uh, the world and 
Jones tried to inquire about wisdom gets paired with this term natural because um, it, the focus began to be specifically on describing uh, nature, describing the world, as opposed to maybe some esoteric theological questions or trying to understand um, what they would call first principles, these like um, abstract principles that underlie the universe and doing metaphysics and these sorts of things, um, people started to like Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon started to say, no, we should like figure out what the world is like. We should figure out like how things work. Um, we should, you know, like how does freezing and thawing work? Um, what about the water cycle? What happens if we drop balls? Can we describe their motion, right? All of this interest in the natural world um, and the name natural philosophers gets applied to these folks. So a lot of the early so-called scientists were um, working under this name of natural philosophers. And you can see, uh, got a couple of examples. We've got uh, the mathematical elements of natural philosophy. This is a, an introduction to, um, it's actually kind of like a commentary on Isaac Newton's philosophy um, called philosophy, but it's actually Isaac Newton's science, right? Um, under this name of natural philosophy. And here we have uh, an engraving. This is... Um, called a philosopher. Um, and you can see what, what this person is doing looks very much like a sort of early, I think it's 1730s um, laboratory experiment. We've got um, this, this sort of, there's no distinction between philosophy and science at that point. Um, for those of you who are interested in these, I've got some links here. You can actually click on those links and go and have a, a closer look at some of these uh, pictures. So now I want us to talk about Francis Bacon and the inductive method. You've probably run across Bacon at some point. Um, he often gets talked about as sort of this uh, leading figure of the scientific revolution. Um, he is well known for introducing the inductive method. Um, his novum organum, um, which means a new system or a new instrument of science, is published in 1620. And if you have questions about that, I can really geek out, geek out about Francis Bacon. But um, one of the things that he does in this piece is he's making a, a case for a new kind of inquiry. So he's prioritizing the pursuit of knowledge of the natural world. Um, he's concerned that medieval and scholastic philosophers have been really uh, concerned about religion, and they've been talking a lot about Aristotle and the ancient Greeks, but that's not really producing new knowledge, he says. Um, he wants new knowledge. He wants knowledge that's useful. He wants knowledge that, um, that describes how the world works. He's not so much interested in these high and, you know, sort of abstract metaphysical principles. And... Um, he sets out what he identifies as the method for achieving this kind of new knowledge. He says that it is repeated careful observation and eliminative induction. What he means by eliminative induction is that you don't just like come up with a hypothesis and then see if you can confirm it. You come up with a hypothesis and then see if it's something that you can rule out, right? You're trying to eliminate different possibilities. Um, he's very aware of things like confirmation bias. He has a really interesting analysis of confirmation bias before it would have been called confirmation bias um, in, in that work. Um, and he talks about the proof and payoff of scientific knowledge being uh, technology, right? He's very interested in being able to use knowledge to be able to accomplish things. And he's famous for this particular uh, phrase that knowledge is power, um, because he thinks that if you know more, you can do more. And, you know, 400 years ago, we have, you know, this is when Bacon's writing this, we have seen that be the case when you just think about um, knowing more about physics, um, we have airplanes and indoor plumbing and all kinds of things, knowing more about medicine. We have uh, antibiotics and uh, all kinds of, you know, organ transplants, things that he would not have even uh, been able to dream of, um, and so on and so forth, that the discovery of all of this knowledge has um, resulted in the application and development of useful technologies. So... Uh, also, in this kind of historical background, wanted to say one other thing that the actual term science gets used um, 
it's, it's relatively recent. The word scientist doesn't get used in its more modern day connotations until about the 1830s. But prior to that, uh, a lot of folks were doing you know, doing um, their academic scholarship in Latin. And there were two words that uh, were common to use. There's some other Greek words that get used too as well, but um, there are two words in particular that people would use. One is cognitio, which has to do with an awareness or a knowledge, but without deep explanation or understanding. And so uh, this is the word that we get our, uh, it's sort of the, the root word of the word cognition. And it's when you are aware of something, right? You know it but you don't necessarily have a deep explanation or understanding of it. So um, a farmer, for instance, um, through personal experience and through years of uh, you know, practice and farming and inherited knowledge uh, has a lot of cognition. They, they know that, um, they know that you know, it's time to plant when the weather gets warm enough and they're aware that they need to like fertilize the fields um, and these sorts of things. The other word here is scientia and scientia is knowledge with an account of causes. Let's think about that for a second. Um, scientia is this word that gets used for not just being aware of something, but really deeply understanding it and understanding how it fits within a larger system, right? Within a larger context, um, the deeper causal mechanisms that um, that create, you know, that, that are, relate to that particular thing. So the farmer has cognitio. The scientist, the scientia, right? That's the person who doesn't just want to know when to plant their crops. They want to know how it works, right? How does, how does the plant grow? Um, why is it that water, you know, makes it grow and sunlight, but other things don't? Or if, if something's wrong with it, what's wrong with it? Can we explain that at a deeper, more fundamental level? Can we really understand the causes of what's going on in that process? And when you get that, when you get that systematized, carefully examined, explained knowledge, you get a scientia, right? Then you have um, the, you know, the, the, uh, broader, deeper understanding of things and how they work. And you can see how closely related that would be to the term science, which is uh, how this, this type of knowledge eventually gets, um, gets applied. People are talking about scientists as those who are pursuing not just knowledge about something, but really deep understanding, knowledge of how it all works, how it all fits together. So, um, one of the things that I think we're pretty familiar with, uh, I don't, I don't know, you know, how this hits or how much of the history of science you know, but all the way from its gradual emergence as this distinct field of inquiry that sort of starts 400 years ago with Francis Bacon, and of course he doesn't think about himself as doing anything sort of, um, he, he doesn't think of himself as a scientist per se. Um, he's doing natural philosophy, philosophy of the natural world, but continuing on. Um, over the next couple of hundred years in the 1800s, that term I think gets adopted uh, specifically by William Huell and, and starts to uh, be used to specifically talk about what we know as modern day science. And in that period of time, all the way from Francis Bacon to now, uh, science is understood as involving particular methods of inquiry. And they, that includes um, careful observations and controlled experiments, repeatability, corroboration through peer review, and so on and so forth. Um, and that that method has been a really key central aspect of what it means to do science. And the idea, uh, sort of a, at one very general level, is that scientists are people who follow scientific methods of inquiry, and that it's the method that gives scientific knowledge um, its legitimacy, right? That if you follow the method and you do so correctly and you do so in an objective way and you, you, know, you, you repeat your observations and so on and so forth, then you're going to get good outputs. Um, the knowledge that you get is going to be uh, stable, it's gonna be trustworthy, and that is why we should trust science. And that is the view that has uh, come under attack really in the last 50 to 70 years in philosophy of science. Um, and that's where I want us to pick up 
with uh, Areskus's book, Why Trust Science. So, um, okay. So let's have a look. Um, first of all, I want to share with you uh, something that's kind of in the background of the way that I think about the justification of knowledge. These are some quotations from philosopher um, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, he has a little book on certainty. And he says, what is the proof that I know something? Most certainly not my saying I know it. I think that's something that, that we're all aware of, but it's good to kind of sit in that for a bit, right? What's the proof that I know something? It's not just that I say I know it, right? If I say I know this, then what's the proof? Well, that statement itself isn't my proof. I need to uh, give more. I need to give some kind of evidence. Where am I getting that from? Why am I trusting that? What's the evidence for that belief as opposed to something else. All right. So just saying that, you know, it doesn't count as proof. And then he also says that certainty is, as it were, a tone of voice in which one declares how things are, but one does not infer from the tone of voice that one is justified. So kind of along the same lines here, um, you know, sometimes we're really certain about stuff, um, but that's just kind of the tone of voice. It's just how confident we are. Certainty itself doesn't doesn't prove anything. It doesn't make it so. I could be really, really certain about stuff that I'm just wrong about, right? Because there's a difference between the what the facts are and then what I think about them. And what I want us to think about here is not just the confidence that people have. People can be very, you know, confidently wrong in many cases, but to think about how to justify scientific inquiry? And that's a really huge question. And uh, here is uh, the way that Oreska starts out the chapter that you read for today. Should we trust science? If so, on what grounds and to what extent? Um, what is the appropriate basis for trust in science, if any? And that's a really big question. It's a big question or, you know, several big questions here for several reasons. One is that science is huge, right? There's all kinds of different um, things included in the study of science, different disciplines and sub-disciplines, different um, uh, facts that are backed up by scientific inquiry, some things that scientists hold very strongly and some that scientists are a lot, you know, it's a lot more tentative, not quite sure about those things. So um, should we trust science? What is it that she's even talking about? Uh, is it some particular scientific claim? Um, I don't think it's any particular scientific claim. I think that what she's talking about is should we trust science as a, a discipline, as an enterprise, right? As a primary way of gathering knowledge about the world. Why should the scientists be trusted as opposed to the crystal gazers or the random bloggers that you read about on the internet or, um, you know, just what Mima said, um, why science as opposed to any one of, of, you know, a dozen other sources of information? What is unique about scientific inquiry? Um, what is the appropriate basis for trust in that? Because we could say, well, we're certain about science. Um, and I, you know, the way that I come at this question is I'm, I'm pretty convinced that science is the best shot that we have at uncovering truth about the world. Um, but, but the question is like, why, right? How can you explain that in virtue of what should it be trusted? And uh, that's what I want us to think about is some different answers to that question. Um, so here's one possibility that Areskes brings up and she, she doesn't uh, spend much time on this. I think this one, it strikes a lot of people as not, not a, a great response. Um, but it is the great man response, right? Um, and this is the idea that the results of scientific investigations are trustworthy to the extent that the people who are doing science are trustworthy. And um, you look back in history and you, you get some folks who make this kind of claim. I think she talks about Lincoln as an example of someone who uh, talks about the trustworthy great men of science, uh, usually men of science um, that, that are supposed to be uh, brilliant. They're supposed to be somehow gifted with 
with insight. Maybe they're more tenacious than the rest of us or better at math than the rest of us. They're Einsteins, right? They're geniuses. Uh, and the main idea here is that science should be trusted insofar as these great men who made scientific discoveries are themselves trustworthy, are honest, they're brilliant, they're reliable, well-meaning, benevolent, et cetera. Um, you can think about that response, whether science is trustworthy insofar as the people who do science are trustworthy. Um, that's not a great response for a couple of reasons. Um, here are some problems, and you might think of more, but some of the ones that uh, that come up, one of those is that, that that myth doesn't actually hold up to critical and historical scrutiny. So even the very idea that science was advanced by these great individuals, again, usually men, working alone, coming to great discoveries. When you start to do the history of science, you find out that that's not the story that we get. You often get um, people who worked in groups. There's a lot of serendipity involved. And what I mean by that is like, um, there's some luck that plays a role. And then there are all kinds of people in the background, sometimes people whose names are not recognized or acknowledged. And I think that as a culture and as historians of science and philosophers of science, um, people are going in and starting to, you know, uncover those stories and tell those stories um, more than they used to be. And just realizing that this whole idea that there are these sort of solitary genius men who uh, reform science every so often, it just isn't true. Um, that's not that's not the history of, of science, uh, if you actually have a look at it. And then, of course, there's this problem that even brilliant, trustworthy people can get things wrong, um, that if you trust someone that that's great and it's important to trust people and we're going to talk about why you know and when scientific expertise should be trusted but that's not really an answer like why you know why should we trust science well because we trust scientists that hasn't gotten us really far um that doesn't give us an account of, of why science itself should be trusted um so it's not a great answer there Another possibility, um, and this is one that Oreska spends a lot more time talking about in the reading that you had for today, has to do with method. And here's where we're going to start to connect that bit that I was talking about with Bacon with um, the reading for today, because it has to do with method. And it's this idea that science is reliable. It's not because of the character of its practitioner, but in virtue of the nature of its practices. There's something about the way that information is gathered, the way that things are observed, the kind of conclusions that you draw, the way you, you know, design an experiment that is better, that if you follow that method, then it really doesn't matter who does it, great men, women, you know, it's, it's much more democratic, right? Anybody can do it, but as long as they follow the right method, then what you get at the end of that is you get good knowledge, right? You get good science. So it's this idea that the reliability of scientific knowledge is found in its method, um, particularly in careful observations and controlled experiments. And uh, Rezkis talks about Comte as an example of that. He uh, puts forward a term that gets picked up in the 20th century, well, really the 21st century in um, about positivism. And it was this movement that happened uh, really about 100 years ago um, in philosophy of science, where uh, people really focused on methods as being the key to why scientific knowledge can be trusted. So just sort of, again, you know, we're sort of tracing this thread, thinking it through. If the answer to why scientific knowledge can be trusted is because its methods can be trusted. Then there's sort of an obvious next question. What are those methods, right? How do we know that those are the good methods? And that's exactly what philosophy of science looked like um, really from like the late 1880s to maybe the 1950s and 60s. Um, lots of focus on trying to describe, identify, um, understand the methods of science, to see what those actually are, and to be able to explain why those are better methods than some of the alternatives. So what are the methods of science? Right, this is that movement, logical positivism, and you get something called empiricism. And um, empiricism has some old roots back in uh, Francis Bacon as well, but it'll do for our purposes to think about, about empiricism as this idea that knowledge is grounded in careful observation and verification. 
that if you want to know something, you need to observe and you need to observe carefully and that experience is what really is the basis of the knowledge that we have about the world and the logical positivists um right this is this group of philosophers of science working in like 1900 to 1950 maybe um they had this really cool idea and the cool idea was that for anything that is a real genuine knowledge claim in science, you should be able to reduce it to some specific observations. So uh, take something that people think that they know, right, that scientists claim that's true. And then you should be able to like, take even like big abstract claims and talk about what you would observe in specific circumstances to show how all of our scientific knowledge can be traced back to fundamental experiences. Um, right, this idea that scientific claims are verifiable through observation, and that science is the practice of formulating meaningful statements using observations to judge whether that meaningful statement is correct, is, uh, is how Reskis puts it. Um, all of the little page numbers here are to the Reskis book, just so you know that, so you know what page to find that on, unless uh, I indicate otherwise there. So um, you could think about something like, I don't know, um, a claim about the, the mass of the moon, right? Um, so the idea that the logical positivist has is like, take whatever this claim is about the mass of the moon, and then you ought to be able to, and that's a, you know, that's a pretty big claim, you ought to be able to reduce that back to very specific descriptions about what you observe and then trace the calculations that get you to the conclusion about what the mass of the moon actually is. And then like you can see how all of your scientific claims are connected with experience and experience plays the role of justifying that claim. And between those two is method, right? Follow the right methods, make sure that you know that that your observations are repeatable and um, objective and then you should be able to get to the scientific knowledge from that um that approach didn't work for a variety of reasons that i can't fully get into um right now i usually spend about six weeks on this when i teach philosophy of science so i'm trying to squish that down into 30 minutes <laughs> or 45 minutes here as a part of this talk um but one of the reasons that that project i'll go back to that slide for a second um one of the reasons that project didn't work is um that it turns out that like sometimes those reductions are pretty easy to do and sometimes they're really really difficult um to take all of our theoretical terms and like put them in terms of very specific observations. And it also didn't work because um, it, there, it, there was sort of an internal problem here that um, this whole idea that knowledge is grounded on careful observation and verification wasn't something that you could know to be true through careful observation and verification. It's a philosophical assumption that you have to make about knowledge and so there there is a worry here that this whole idea was uh inconsistent because the very claim that you have to ground all your knowledge and careful observation well that claim how do you observe that to be true right it, it it doesn't get you out of philosophical claims and that was thought to be a big problem with logical positivism so one of the things that comes next is uh, a view called falsificationism. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm checking in on the chat kind of as we're going, and I see a question that would be really good to answer right here. Do logical positivists and empiricists mean exactly the same thing? That's a really great question, Ethan. Um, the answer is no, but uh, that sometimes you will see people who write about it use the terms interchangeably. So, um, I would say that they don't mean the same thing. And that's because empiricism is actually a much broader uh, umbrella. You'll get uh, people who are working and who are identified as empiricists who don't identify as logical positivists. And one example would be the um, some of the earlier philosophers like David Hume gets called an empiricist or Locke sometimes gets, uh, John Locke gets called an empiricist. And they, they don't even have any conception of positivism. But empiricism is the view that um, 
experience is prioritized when it comes to knowing. And you can contrast that with what sometimes gets called rationalism. And that is a view that reason is what gets priority whenever you're thinking about knowledge. And so you've got rationalist philosophers who say you have to think logically about things um, and come up you know, through careful derivations and deductions based on axioms and first principles and these sort of self-evident assumptions. That's where you start with your knowledge of the world. And the empiricists say, no, you have to start with observation. Bacon, for instance, uh, ex another example of an empiricist who says we start with observation. The logical positivists are one particularly influential group of empiricists that um, in some ways were the the predominant philosophy of science for the first half of the 20th century? That's a great question. So what happens next? Um, one of the things that happens next is a view called falsificationism. And this is, um, I think, probably going to be familiar to many of you, if not in name, at least the process that I'm describing is going to be familiar because a lot of scientists actually do this. Um, this is part of scientific training. And Popper says uh, through his own history or study of the history of science, um, he starts out as a physicist and then gets really interested in philosophical issues. Um, he says, you know, science doesn't proceed through verification. It's not about looking for a hypothesis and then trying to like support it or somehow reduce it back to some fundamental observations, but it's actually through the opposite process um, of falsification, trying to rule things out, right? Trying to prove that something is wrong and that if you have a, a, a hypothesis, um, a claim, something that you're testing, that withstands multiple repeated attempts to falsify it, then in virtue of surviving attempts to falsify it, that becomes the foundation for scientific knowledge. Um, and Popper actually uh, sort of famously uses this as a way to tell when something is scientific and when it's not scientific. Because he says, look, if it's going to really genuinely be scientific, then there have to be some observations that make a difference that, that you can like, you know, there has to be some skin in the game in terms of, um, are there some predictions that you could actually observe? Um, what evidence would be relevant? What would show you that this was true or show you that this is false? And if you get a claim that can fit with any evidence, then it's not science, it's pseudoscience. So if you get, um, well, I have this little little box down here at the bottom, what's wrong with a theory that can fit with any evidence whatsoever? That's an interesting question to think about. If I have a theory and I say, okay, um, my, my theory is, and I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but um, my theory is uh, that um, essential oils can cure headaches. And uh, you say, okay, well, is there a claim in there that I could test Right. Can I actually like set up some kind of clinical study, uh, some kind of trial where I could actually test that and see, okay, here's my control group. Here's my other group um, that I'm going to give the oils to, and we're going to collect some data, right? That's what you have to do. And if you do that collection of data, and then what you get back is that the oil didn't make any difference at all, or maybe it did, right? You have to look at the data here. Um, but if you get back that it didn't, and somebody says, oh, well, that's because like, you know, it only happens if you use, um, you know, certain amounts and you have to do it at the right time and this kind of thing. Um, what you have to have in order for something to be science is you have to have people who are willing to say, okay, if my theory is right, this is what we should observe. And you can actually test that. And when you test it, it will show you whether that's correct or whether that's not correct. And you follow that evidence. And Popper says that this is how science really works. It's this method of not confirmation, but falsification. Um, we're constantly trying to rule things out. We're trying to prove that we're false. And this is a really good way to, um, to try to push up against confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is the tendency, it's a psychological tendency that people have to pay attention to things that confirm what you already believe. And you don't give as much weight to or, or attention to evidence that goes against what you already believe. But in science, you're supposed to be on the lookout for the possibility that you're wrong, even trying to prove that something is false. 
And then the things that stand up to that kind of scrutiny, those are the things that, um, that sort of get to, to go on and become the basis for further reasoning. So that's um, falsificationism, super fast. Um, what happens next in philosophy of science is that you get this whole group of folks, uh, Pierre Duhem, uh, W.D. Quine, and others who are talking about uh, a, a different kind of problem. Um, this one is the problem of underdetermination. Sometimes it gets called radical holism. And I want to land here for just a minute because I think this is a really interesting observation and important and challenging observation. And I think that Quine in particular, his views about belief in the world, his epistemology can be really um, interesting. So uh, what is underdetermination about? So I was just, when I was talking about Popper, describing this procedure where you, you know, you take a, a hypothesis that's part of this theory and you actually say, okay, here's what we should expect if the theory is true. And here's what we should expect if it's false. And we're going to actually run the test. And then that way we can see if we can falsify this hypothesis. That makes it sound like you've got a theory and you've got a really specific hypothesis and then you just test it. And if, you know, if you falsify it, then that shows you your theory is wrong. And um, that doesn't actually seem to be the way that it works. Um, certainly not, uh, you know, in some of these discussions about underdetermination. So what is under underdetermination about? So um, I'll read you this quote and then we'll talk through different parts of it. Duhem observes that any test of a hypothesis is simultaneously a test of the specific hypothesis under consideration, right? The thing that we're trying to test that's right. But also, anytime you're running a study, you've also got an experimental setup. You've got auxiliary hypotheses, background assumptions. What are all these kinds of things? You've got assumptions about the equipment you're using, about the, uh, the way that that works. You've got a bunch of background theory and assumptions about what you're observing and what you might expect under different conditions. You're not just testing a single hypothesis. You've got a whole bunch of different assumptions in the background in your system. And what actually happens here is when you're making that test or when you're doing that test, you're testing the whole system, the whole theory, plus all of these assumptions, plus um, you know assumptions about um, the experiment itself. Now, suppose you do an experiment and the hypothesis that you were testing, it looks like um, your predictions did not actually turn out to be correct. Can you then go back and assume that your theory is incorrect? Well, Duhem says sort of, but what that actually tells you is something in the entire experimental setup isn't right, but it doesn't tell you what. Right? It could be an aspect of your theory. It could be some way that you've applied it incorrectly. It could be a glitch in your equipment or in your observations. And you don't necessarily know which part of the whole setup was problematic. So this is what he means by saying there's underdetermination. Right? You know something in the whole system is wrong, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what. And there's a, a bit of leeway here. A scientist has to kind of go back and you know double check kinds of things. Was this a problem with my, with my experimental procedure? Was this a problem with some background assumptions I made? Was this actually, you know, is this actually a, a, a falsification of the hypothesis that I was indeed testing? So all of that means that a failed experiment doesn't necessarily reveal where the failure lies. And a successful experiment doesn't mean that you succeeded either, right? That um, it doesn't preclude that, that there's some different experimental arrangement or other hypotheses that would have revealed some difficulty um, just because your experiment is not quite set up to, to track that. Okay, so what do we do about that? Um, well, things get a little bit more philosophical and I think problematic too when you zoom out a little bit um, because Quine's observations here is that this is not just a feature about scientific experiments, it's a feature about 
human knowledge in general. Um, it has to do with the way that beliefs and experience connect with each other. So um, often in a tradition, again, going back to some of the early uh, philosophers, uh, natural philosophers like Descartes, knowledge was thought to build on a foundation. And even the, you know, the logical positivists thought that if you start with some really good, careful observations, then that's what you can really know. And then you can build up from there, almost like you're building a wall or a pyramid. You have a really good foundation and you can go to your next level. And as long as your observations are, are correct and accurate and you're moving very carefully from one step to the next, your whole building is gonna have a really great foundation and structure. It's all gonna be, you know, be secure and it's not gonna come tumbling down. Um, Quine says, mm, that's not how that works. Okay. Um, because he says knowledge is a web of belief, right? Instead of thinking about knowledge, like a wall built on this foundation of experience, he changes the metaphor saying that knowledge is much more like a web of belief, uh, meaning that there are edges of experience that connect to, um, that everyone encounters, that we all have to make sense of. But the way that those experiences get connected, the way that they get made sense of, brought into a coherent whole, well, they're just different webs that will fit within the same experiences, right? So your beliefs aren't like a wall or a pyramid. They're much more like a web where you've got kind of different nodes and some of them are really central. They're core beliefs that you have that really affect the way that you think about everything else. Um, some of them are, are not so important. Some of them you can change and update and revise. You might figure out that you're wrong about something and it's just no big deal. Um, other ones are really core. If you find out you're wrong about that, you have to, you know, it changes a lot. You have to go back and think through a lot of different things. Um, that our experience is what holds the web in place. It's absolutely essential, right? It, but it touches at the edges and there are just this variety of ways to connect those experiences in an account of the whole. And that raises a similar question about belief in general too. And that is like, how do you know when you get new evidence, which part of your web needs to be changed? Or if something goes wrong, you know, sometimes people decide um, maybe without even thinking about it, but you know, we, the, our reaction will be that it's easier to sort of reinterpret the evidence than it is to make a significant change in our web. Um, sometimes the uh, challenge from experience gets so great that it results in kind of a crisis, right? That maybe significant portions of our web of belief will break down and we end up having to like do a lot of rebuilding and that can be a painful and difficult process to go through. But Quine says um, there isn't one obvious way to connect all of the different experiences we have. We try different things. We often choose what causes the least disruption to the web to try to get everything to cohere. And I think that that's actually a, a pretty good way of thinking about scientific inquiry, that um, there are all these data points, right? There's all this experience. And what science is trying to do is to, to find an account that best makes sense of that, right? That fits best with all of that data. But part of that is gonna involve different decisions about what needs revising and what doesn't need revising. Um, and that's a, a process that doesn't, it's not linear. It's not obvious that it's just always one solution. Um, so what do we do with that? Um, well, I wish I could talk more about Kuhn because Thomas Kuhn comes in and talks about paradigms and paradigm shifts. And if you're familiar with that language, um, I highly recommend that you read uh, his, I guess it's, it's over 50 years ago that he published The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it's a super readable book um, where he talks about the way that science actually develops. Um, isn't a linear progression, but it's through these sort of moments where things become in crisis and you realize you need to revise a bunch and then um, sort of the web that you have breaks down. He doesn't use web, uh, that's Quine's term, but Kuhn talks about like your paradigm breaking down and then you have to then uh, adopt a new paradigm, um, something else that guides the way that uh, that you're thinking about scientific inquiry. So we can talk about that more in the Q&A if you want to. But I wanted to talk a little bit now about this method response um, so that we can get to the view that Oreska says is 
um, sort of the, the current view of why trust science, or at least the view that she's putting forward. So um, this idea that science is reliable, not by virtue of the character of its practitioner, but by the nature of its practices, right? We've been talking about method. Maybe there's something about method, um, right? What are the problems here? Well, one of the problems is that science doesn't seem to have a single method. It's a collection of many different methods applied in various ways, depending on the field of study. Um, when I talk to scientists and I use the word method, at least around here, they're always like, mm, we don't have a scientific method. There's a whole bunch of different methods and we apply them in different contexts for different purposes. So I think that's interesting to keep uh, in mind. There's also, and this is going to start to become increasingly important, um, the observation that so far, what we've been talking about in terms of method and some of the other problems with it, uh, the challenge from holism, the challenge uh, from underdetermination, right, that all of that is focusing on individual practices. It's conceptualizing science as a solitary individual activity. And in fact, you know, both of the answers that we've looked at, the sort of um, great man of science response and then this sort of method response um, are the kind of thing that thinks about science as something that the individual does that uh, you know a person following the method or a person who's brilliant and trustworthy right that's the source of trust in science and what has happened in the last i don't know maybe 30 years or so in um in epistemology of science in philosophy of science especially because of the influence of a lot of feminist work in the, the 1980s and 1990s um has been a, a re-emphasis or refocus on thinking about the social aspects of science right um that science oh let's see oh yeah um forgot there was a third one methods depend on paradigms but paradigms change over time but like thinking about social science um i don't mean social science but social aspects of science okay so is it important is it relevant that science happens in community and what we mean by that is that it's not just a single individual person out there doing scientific work but that scientists are talking to each other. They are reading each other's work, examining each other's experiments, you know, throwing around different ideas um, through the process of conferences and peer review. And how is the social organization, how is society and the different norms that govern scientific inquiry relevant to this question about why trust science? And, um, Reska says, and I agree with her, and we can talk about this because there, you know, there's disagreement about this as well, but that scientific knowledge is fundamentally consensual. And what she means by that is that it is resulting from the consensus of a critical community. And that's what I want us to kind of focus on for the last 15 or 20 minutes here as we um, start to get into the last part of um last part of, of what I've got for you today. So let's think about this idea about the relevance of this the sort of group, the community of scientists to understanding um, why science might be trusted. And I want to bring in one final piece to this um, discussion that I think will help things to fall into place. And that has to do with thinking about objectivity and whether objectivity is something that you can have in scientific inquiry. Because um, another piece of this puzzle is that the idea of objectivity seems now um, to be something that's very elusive. There's the, you know, the observation that, that human beings occupy particular perspectives right, that we all are within, we're working within certain social contexts, we're working within our own backgrounds, our own background assumptions, our own upbringing, our own social location and social identity. And um, there was a, a particular point in which um, some folks thought that this actually meant that you can't have 
any objective knowledge, right? That, that there's just, that's impossible. Um, what we've just got is we've got a bunch of people working on stuff from their own backgrounds and biases and values. Um, but, you know, that just means that all science is going to be biased. And some people have, have argued for that. They've made that claim. And what Oreskes is doing here is she's attempting to take into account both the social aspects of um, scientific communities and think about how that's relevant to the production of scientific knowledge. And we're also going to see that attention to diversity is going to start to play a role in this account as well. So her claim is that knowledge that reflects the when this is her term, right, the critically achieved consensus of the scientific community, that that's actually the closest thing that we have to objective knowledge. But we need to talk about what that means, right? How can having this critically achieved consensus of the scientific community, why is that evidence of truth, right? Why, is, why does that give this legitimacy and justification to scientific knowledge? Um, so let's move on from there. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show this slide again in a minute. So this is something that Oreskes doesn't include in this chapter. And I, I kind of wish she had, um, because I find it a really useful way to think about this. Um, so I'm gonna add it here to this presentation as well. Uh, Narada Kirka from my alma mater from uh, Indiana University has a really great piece called Belief Buddies versus Critical Communities, the Social Organization of Pseudoscience. And she's thinking about, you know, how do you tell science, like real science from pseudoscience, fake science, right? And she, um, in that piece, uh, articulates two different kinds of communities. And I find this a really helpful way to think about uh, the way that, that social organizations can be uh, brought together and how, they, um, how that relates to sort of what holds them together and to truth. So one of the groups that she identifies there, it's kind of a a group that she says these, they're belief buddies. When you have a group that is a belief buddies group, you have a group where membership is organized around shared beliefs. So um, it is precisely because you all share some kind of belief that brings you together, uh, maybe in a religious context, or maybe everybody's like really interested in uh, organic farming or something. There are all kinds of reasons and things that will, will bring people together. And it is that shared belief, that shared goal that, that unifies you. And so in that group, in order to remain a part of it and to belong to it, you have to promote claims that reinforce that shared identity and those core beliefs. If you're with a group and everybody's into organic farming, and then you start wondering if you really want to be an organic farmer, that's going to kind of put you outside the group, right? Because what's holding everybody together is that shared, uh, shared commitment. So to a certain extent, in a lot of these sort of belief buddy groups, criticism is unwelcome, right? And if you start criticizing the core things that bring you to that group, you might end up finding yourself on the outside um, because you have severed the thing that kept you, you know, you've severed the thing that was important for your group membership. Kurtka says that science is a critical community. And this means that group membership is organized not around shared beliefs, or at least not in the same way. There's not a particular set of things that you have to believe if you're a scientist, but you do have to have a commitment to rigorous methods of evidence gathering. That there is a role for method in these communities, that people who are part of the scientific critical community are going to be committed to things like careful observation, repeatability, um, all the different you know, aspects of scientific methods that have been tried and tested over the years, that that's going to be a, a, a core part of it, but that the commitment there is going to be to discovery of the truth. And that means that any claim, whatever it would be, if you have good evidence to back it up, there's going to be uh, openness to having a look at that, to following it through, to looking at the evidence that you have for that. So there's actually a promoting of claims that survive critical scrutiny. Think about this. If you're in a part of a community where the goal is to follow the evidence and believe what is true, and somebody brings you a really well-developed case for that, then that's going to be welcome because that doesn't challenge the identity of the community. In fact, it, it furthers it. <laughs> 
So well-informed criticism is going to be welcome and it's going to be viewed as this positive contribution to the group. And you can see that that kind of critical community has a really different character than a, a belief buddied character, uh, a group that's organized around that. And there's nothing wrong per se about belief buddies, right? If everybody likes to organic farm and you want to get together and do that, great. But notice that that's not a truth seeking enterprise. Insofar as scientists are aimed at that description that I started off talking about at the beginning, right? Um, really understanding that scientia, having an account that withstands scrutiny about what the world is like and how things fit together, um, right? If that's your goal, then it's not the particular beliefs that hold you together as much as what unifies you is that shared commitment to that critical scrutiny and informed uh, criticism is going to be a really central part of that. So with that um, addition, I think, to what Arezkis has here, um, we get this claim. And it's a rethinking of objectivity. And I realize we're, we're getting in deep here, <laughs> um, but we're almost done. So hang with me. Um, the philosopher of science, feminist philosopher of science, Helen Longino, um, did a lot of work uh, to talk about objectivity. And she argues that the notion of ob objectivity is important um, in science isn't objectivity at the level of the individual. She doesn't think that a single person could necessarily have an objective view. And that's because individual people have particular contexts and biases and backgrounds and lenses. And we all, you know, we can't really get outside of those. Um, but she also doesn't think that that means that scientific objectivity is impossible. I'm really sorry. That's happening. Hopefully that doesn't disrupt. Um, to get my screen back. Is that working? Can y'all see again? Okay. Um, yeah, we're good. So, um, okay. So how does this objectivity work? Um, Longino says that objectivity is the kind of thing that you don't get as an individual, but that doesn't mean there's no such thing as objectivity. It means there's no such thing as individual objectivity, but you've got something better. Objectivity is the kind of thing that you pursue across a group. And she calls that strong active or strong objectivity. And so it's this idea that an individual working alone is at best going to only achieve partial knowledge. Your knowledge is always going to be situated within your own background, your social historical context. Um, but what if a diverse group of scientists evaluate and correct each other? Well, in that case, the knowledge produced by the group is going to be stronger precisely because it has withstood that critical scrutiny of an entire community of experts. And she says, this is our best chance at objectivity, right? This is strong objectivity. If you have things that have survived the scrutiny of a critical community, and not just any critical community, but specifically a diverse critical community where you have people from different backgrounds having a look at it, knowing that they come from different perspectives and different angles, and they've been part of this process of, um, of analyzing, evaluating, retrying, testing, coming up with ideas, coming up, you know, input into that process, that that is going to be the very best we can do at having something like objectivity. It is strong objectivity as a result of uh, views that aren't just because of an individual following the method, but have survived that kind of social um, critical community and that kind of scrutiny. So she talks about this process of transformative interrogation. Um, she says that uh, the objectivity of individuals in this scheme consists in their participation in the collective give and take of critical discussion and not in some special relation, detachment, hard-headedness they may bear to their observations. So for, you know, for a while it was lots of folks would, would think, or there was this idea that um, a scientist has to be really distant. They have to have a objectivity. They have to be detached. Um, and Longino is really challenging that. She's saying, now you've got to uh, not pretend that you're objective, but actually like 
try to try to articulate, try to identify your particular biases, the limitations of your perspective, and then put yourself in a community with other people who are different from you are because they're going to be able to see those much better than you can. And if you have, um, you know, if you have that kind of community doing science, then you're going to have a much better understanding or much better chance, I would say, at whatever it is that that community comes to consensus about is going to have that um, strong objectivity. So thus understood, objectivity is dependent on the depth and scope of this process of transformative interrogation that occurs in any given scientific community. Um, yeah, good. So put another way, again, this is Razka's um, page 53, objectivity is likely to be maximized when there are recognized and robust avenues for criticism, such as peer review, when the community is open, non-defensive and responsive to criticism, when the community is sufficiently diverse, that a broad range of views can be developed, heard, and appropriately considered. Um, and I think that's, that's I mean, that's sort of the the key, um, that the community of scientists matters, and that the community, uh, the diversity of the community of scientists matters, that method is still a part of this, right, that there are certain methods that uh, that have been, have withstood, you know, the test of time in those, in those communities that people um, trust. Falsification is a part of this, that um, people will put something forward and other people will attempt to falsify it and uh, things that withstand that falsification or those attempts to falsify um, get accepted by that community, um, that all of that is part of the process. So, um, how is science like plumbing? <laughs> okay, assessing expertise. Um, there's a really great analogy, I think, toward the end of this chapter where Areska says, well, like, okay, uh, thinking about like scientific consensus, right? When something has scientific consensus, that's what should be trusted. Not necessarily the new experimental stuff. Scientists are usually the first to say that they don't know when they don't know. But the stuff that's withstood the test of time, right? The stuff that, that a scientist have been achieving consensus on, for instance, like climate change. Um, if you look at where the consensus is, that's what you should follow in knowing where, you know, what to believe about um, various various issues, look for where there's consensus. And when you think about expertise and thinking about how to assess who to trust, um, I think that it's helpful. Like we're all pretty good at assessing uh, plumbers. And there's also not an idea that somehow um, we need to all become experts in plumbing in order to do um, fix our own sinks and toilets in our household. And you can maybe see some of the parallels here um, that there's this idea that's, you know, sometimes makes it sound as though anybody can just go and have a look and read a couple of blogs online, and then they'll become an expert in climate science, and then they can just have really, you know, their own informed opinion and, and view. And, um, what I've been saying here and what Areskis is developing here really says that's that's not that doesn't work. That's not how that goes. Um, if you need an expert plumber, you can go and you can watch some YouTube videos, but that doesn't make you an expert plumber. Maybe you'll get lucky and you'll get right. But like if you really need, you know, a, you know if you have a, a major plumbing problem, you, you call a plumber. And the reason that you call a plumber is because they know, right? They have all the right tools. They've, they've uh, been trained in a trade. They're certified. Um, they've seen a bunch of stuff before. And, you know, we, we, we trust that. We trust them as experts in their field. And this doesn't mean that all plumbers are trustworthy. Sometimes you get a bad one, right? Sometimes, um, you know, you might ask around and say, who do you trust? Who, who are you going to call? Um, people will get, you know, get a good reputation in their field. And we call those people. Um, pay them more, right? Um, but that like the assessment of expertise and the recognition of expertise is already a part of our practice in so many different ways in medicine, plumbing, um, car repair, and so on and so forth. And that science, you know, anybody can participate in science, just like anyone can become a plumber. But if you're not a plumber, 
you probably like, you know, you need to look for the people who do know what they're talking about. And that something parallel here uh, is the case in science as well, that what you're looking for is you're looking for expertise and that expertise as shown by the consensus of the scientific community. And that if, you know, if you want to go and get a higher degree in climate science, then you become one of those experts and you're then qualified to talk about that. But that there's this, this, um, you know, this recognition of science as a, an expertise that takes time and methods and skill to do, and that the consensus of science is really um, what, what should be trusted there. So um, I'm about, I've got about 10 minutes to go and that works out pretty well because I did want to just say something real quick. What about bioethics? Okay, back to, back to where we began. So um, you probably can tell I like thinking about where words come from. So bio from a Greek word meaning life and then ethics, um, the field of philosophy that studies moral values, principles and actions and things like character. Um, so when you're doing bioethics, you have the study of values, actions, principles, um, morality, specifically when it comes to uh, the life sciences, the uh, health sciences, thinking about the, the different complex issues that are involved in making decisions and applications and the impact that those um, that various practices have on people, right? So bioethics being the study of the ethical, social, and legal issues related to health and life sciences, including medicine and medical research. That's kind of the focus, right? That's That's what we're going for. And as we sort of kick off this May intercession three week um, intensive adventure in bioethics, I just wanna leave you with some questions. One of those questions, which I guess is the most important one because I stuck it on its own slide and made the letters really big, right? Um, what does it look like to do bioethics in a critical community? And I think that that's an interesting thing to, uh, to ask. And I really love the way that this particular course is set up because it is set up in exactly that kind of way that I was talking about previously, where you are going to get to hear from experts in their field, from people who are, who are doing it, who have uh, had years of training or, you know, in uh, practice and experience um, working with the kinds of things that they are going to be talking about and um, giving you readings from experts that, um, that that is it's sort of a center of this, um, this class. And I think that's really fantastic. So um, also, what does it look like for you as a class, right, um, to think about doing bioethics and about thinking of yourself as uh, a participant in that critical community through this class and of this class as, uh, you know, kind of a, its own critical community that um, things are meant to be challenged and, you know, taken into account and thought through and that, you know, we, it's important to look at things from different perspectives. A lot of that is already built in to the syllabus and to the curriculum. And you've got, you know, a diverse range of people that you'll be hearing from and to, um, to just kind of be aware of that and be thinking about how that affects the bioethics uh, that we'll be doing here. And then I've got a list of questions. These are just some questions that I was thinking about that you might want to have in the background as you think about um, and go through the different uh, different units in this class. Um, one of the ones that I'm starting out with is what are the facts, right? What is the consensus of those who have expertise in this field? I think that you have to have consensus or you have to have an understanding of the consensus um, of the facts in a particular area if you're going to do bioethics, because if you're trying to uh, deal with what can be sometimes really tricky, complicated, um, nuanced, ethical problems, problems of values and, and uh, people interacting with each other and impact and harm and these sorts of things, but you can't even agree on the facts, um, that's, it's really difficult. We live in a world now, uh, in the last several years in particular, where things are fragmented and people don't agree about the facts. And so, um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to start this talk in the way that I do that give you some way of thinking about who to trust and why, and why that's better than some of these other alternatives. 
and to really um, promote uh, an information-based assessment of things that you have to really understand the situation. You have to understand what we know and what we don't know um, if you're going to do bioethics responsibly. Right. So what's the consensus of those who have expertise in this field? Are we as informed as we need to be about this issue in order to make good decisions? I, like, I feel like if people would ask that question in legislature, in government, in hospitals, right, are we as informed as we need to be about this issue in order to make good decisions? That that could be a really transformative question. Um, some more traditional kinds of things that you would think about in bioethics, um, what kind of values are in play? which values are being given priority? Um, can you find shared values across potentially opposed viewpoints? Um, also whose interests are being represented? I think that's really important. And this connects up with that, um, the idea of a critical community needing to be sufficiently diverse. Um, because if you, if you don't have a diverse community, then you can't see the biases of the people who are just like you. Um, that diversity becomes a strength. Um, I, uh, right. So are there any perspectives that are hidden or underexplored? Who else do we need to bring to the table to really understand this problem and to talk about it? Um, are there perspectives that are underexplored that are being left out that need to be included to brought into the room in the conversation? And then who does this decision impact? Right. Who benefits? Who's harmed? Um, that's really crucial because oftentimes you will find that the folks who are making the decisions are a different group of people from the folks who are being impacted by those decisions. So have all the various stakeholders been included in that decision making? Um, this is just, you know, these are some questions that I would encourage you to kind of keep in the background as you start to look much more specifically at uh, particular bioethical uh, questions as we move past the sort of initial framing section that I've been working on today. So that is what I've got for you. And it looks like I've got five minutes um, to spare. And let's see, I'm gonna take a look at the chat and see if there are any questions there that we could talk about in the next five minutes. Um, yeah, so uh, we've got, I'm just kind of reading down. We've got a, a comment here from Annette. Um, saying that she thought that uh, science was reliant on scientific method only, that those steps were needed only to develop new scientific conclusions. And I think that that's, that's the impression that a lot of textbooks give and that you kind of hear. And, you know, in some ways it's, it's a, it's a caricature of the history <laughs> of the development of science. And so I don't think it's horrible. I don't think it's bad. Um, they're like methods, a good place to start. Um, but, uh, method runs into some problems, partly, I mean, you know, some of the ones that we've talked about under determination and these sorts of things, but also it's, it's so individualistic, right? It's not really taking into the account, into account the importance, um, and really the fact when you look back in the history of science, that scientists do not work individually, they work in communities. Um, and that's, uh, thinking about how the the character of that community plays a role in science uh, as a really fruitful area of research and philosophy of science yeah um cassidy has a really good question what happens when one member of a group is more influential does this mean that the objectivity can become skewed um if one individual in the group maybe has more more power in the group and is dominating that group and is able to repress other um, perspectives or is able to um, hold more sway than they should. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that can mean that objectivity can become skewed. I think that objectivity, the way that Oreskes uses it here, is not so much objectivity as a a place that you know you have arrived at as much as it is held up as an ideal that you are continually striving for and measuring your group against. Um, so there's a certain sort of humility, I think, that's involved here. I would be very wary of saying, ah, this is it. We've reached the maximally diverse critical community outcomes. Now we know 100% for sure. Um, but it's not that kind of thing. As much as it is a, um, let's 
really try to do the best with what we've got. And the way that we do that is we're really careful about our observations and we try to falsify things and we come at it with this transformative interrogation, this approach. Um, and we're really, you know, sensitive to who's being, who's participating in that process because that participation in the process is going to help make our community more objective by revealing biases that we've hidden. And if people, you know, if, if some people have, um, difficulty with that kind of openness, then that can really block, um, block progress in that area. Yeah. So, um, let's see, I'm looking at our time here too. So oh, I'll do one more quick question. Um, the reading reference times where criticisms of scientists ideas was met with hostility. Yes. Um, can the line between critical community and belief buddy community become blurred in that case? Can one turn into the other? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, you know, we theorize these things as though they're sort of obviously distinct and here's the critical community and here's the belief buddy, but in reality, things are a lot more messy. Um, that's something that starts as a critical community can start to look like a group of belief buddies pretty quickly. Um, that's probably the more common one. Um, critical communities are hard to sustain. You have to really have that commitment um, to inquiry that is beyond uh, i mean it takes a lot of sort of detachment from your you know from having to be right all the time or you have to have the humility to be able to um not be in charge sometimes to to recognize that you might be the one who needs to change and so you know subject your own beliefs to this kind of um transformative interrogation that's hard it's hard to do um so i i again thinking about that more as an ideal that you that you continually strive for, maybe like democracy. <laughs> it's, something, it's something we all keep like working at, I think uh, is the way to go. Um, I see another question there, but I think that one might might be best uh, in uh, taken in the, the Q&A that's gonna happen in a little bit. So I will wrap up here and turn things back over. And there we go. Hello. Hello, Hello, everyone. That was fantastic. Brilliant. Absolutely. What, a, what an awesome setup to our class. <laughs> Thank you for such a fabulous beginning. Yes. So uh, we really appreciate that was a, yeah, wow. I want to come take your class. <laughs> All right, y'all, we have a 15 minute break and we will be back at 1145 for the seminar. Students who've been asking amazing questions. I knew this was a really good crew of honor scholars from across the state. So I have a feeling we're gonna have a lively hour from 1145 to 1245. So we'll be back in 15 minutes. And again, thank you, Professor Mason. Thank you.